Okay, great, you guys are all nice and quiet, so <laughs> good to start. Okay, so I'm um, going to be teaching again for a bit, Hilo, Henry Lester, and I will be trading off um, as we get more into systems, and we'll start today looking at our first sensory system, which is the visual system. Before we do that, any announcements from TAs? I think the midterm is, are there TAs here? No. Okay, well, I think the... Um, Midterm is posted, is that correct? Does anybody know? Or will be posted? Is it posted? It's posted. Posted. Okay, so the midterm's up, so take that soon. Uh, and I guess tomorrow you have discussion sections where you guys can review and ask your TAs about content that you've covered so far in preparation for taking the midterm. Any questions uh, about course logistics? You guys are all happy with uh, how things are going so far, discussion sections, etc. Okay, so we're going to go into vision, and as we had before, uh, so the PDF of, I think all the three vision lectures, the PDFs are up on the course website, or at least my, my two are. Um, it's, um, so we trade off a little bit. We, we, today we basically go over a sort of an overview of the visual system um, that focuses on just basic principles, um, the retina, topography, the thalamus, and that's probably about it. And then on... Um, Friday. Uh, Henry Lester is going to talk about phototransduction in more detail, how light is converted into pot uh, electrical potential changes that the brain then uses to construct a representation of the visual world. Um, and then on next Monday, um, we'll go into more higher level um, vision and object recognition. And so the points that are important to note, as before, are written down here, so you can take a look at all of these. The readings overlap to some extent, um, but they're basically these four uh, chapters, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, uh, in your book. So read those. And uh, here's then an overview of what we're going to try to cover today. So we're going to sort of have an overview as I mentioned, in general, of the visual system, uh, and to talk about early, relatively early stages of visual processing, um, visual perception, what happens in the retina, how central projections from the retina go into the brain, and in particular, the first place that they go, the main place in primates that we're going to concern ourselves with, is a portion of the thalamus. Remember, all sensory modalities, with the exception of smell, go through this collection of nuclei in the brain, the thalamus. So there's a nucleus there, the LGN, which stands for lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, and then only from there does information get relayed on up to visual cortex, which is parenthetical here because we probably won't get to it, and instead we'll be covering it on Monday. And so Monday, then we go on, uh, so Friday again, Henry Lester will tell you about phototransduction in the retina in much more detail, and then Monday we'll go on and talk about uh, uh, primary visual cortex, higher order visual cortices, and what it is that these regions do. And a lot of that, a lot of our knowledge uh, there in humans comes from using um, fMRI. So we'll talk a little bit about high-level vision there. Okay, so the challenge, just broadly, you've seen these before, I think, is, uh, has been, has always been, to um, explain how stimuli in the world give rise to behavior. And so nervous systems mediate this, and there's a variety of ways in which people have thought about this. Uh, behaviorism treated this as sort of a black box, and you could just come up with a bunch of rules that would, um, that would describe law-like relationships between stimuli impinging on organism over time and learning and so forth, and how that changed behavior. Uh, there are a number of reasons that that uh, fell out of fashion in the 1950s, 1960s, 1950s mostly. Um, one being that this doesn't account for how flexible behavior is. And in particular, even if you take the identical stimulus and present it to uh, you know, a brain, uh, even brains that are very similar to one another, um, you typically, you often get different kinds of behavior. So it turned out to be very difficult to predict just on the basis of sort of the rigid kinds of rules that people might have put into this black box. And instead, people needed to elaborate very rich internal mechanisms inside this black box, i.e. the mind and cognition and the whole architectures that cognitive psychology came up with. There's another 
component, of course, here that uh, until uh, also historically people have left out, uh, but now now people are looking at it as a dependent measure that uh, it has some value, which is that it seems like in addition to generating the beha behavior, the brain generates something else. Although the only access that you have to that, at least in the case of people other than yourselves, is behavior. But typically from behavior, and in your own case, not on the basis of behavior, uh, you infer that there's some kind of subjective experience that's being generated by this as well. Uh, and there's lots of studies nowadays looking at that as a, as a valid source of, um, source of data. So that's how things look then going forth in cognitive psychology. And of course, um, well, actually mostly really in humans, at least, you know, 1990s or so. So fMRI really wasn't invented until the sort of mid-1990s and really didn't take off until the late 1990s. So it's extremely recent. But um, this is a monkey brain shown down here. But what we want to do now, what we want to do in this course, is to unpack this and not just have some box and arrow architecture that cognitive psychologists would have had that's informed solely by relationships between stimuli and behavior. But in fact, we can look inside and open this up and with electrophysiology and fMRI and other tools that we have available, we can actually start to really figure out how this works mechanistically in the brain. And so all these techniques have made that possible. So to just take a look at this in a little more detail, this is a picture from Earl Miller at MIT, who's a researcher who works in monkeys with electrophysiology. And it's oversimplified, but it gives you a little preview of what we're going to be talking about the next three lectures, which is the visual system. So the story that we would like to tell is a monkey, say a trained monkey, the simplest kind of experiment, is sitting there, you flash something on a screen, and it has to push a button in order to get a reward when it does so. A typical kind of monkey task. So the question is, how does the brain link what comes into the eye, the visual stimulus that you as the experimenter put on the screen, to the output from the system, which is the monkey pushing the button, right? So, well, we know quite a bit about what goes on in there, at least in the simplest possible case, we could, you know, sort of trace something like a path through the brain that would mediate this. The problem is, of course, that it's not just that path, but from every one of these places, there's, you know, a hundred different arrows going to many places. Nonetheless, the causally most potent path, so to speak, or at least one of them, is illustrated here. So there's transduction in the retina. You'll hear more about that on Friday in Henry Lester's lecture. One feature of transduction in the retina is that it is slow because it involves second messengers. So it's not as fast as, say, audition, a sensory transduction in audition, or sensory transduction for some aspects of touch. It takes some time for light hitting the retina to be transduced into changes in electrical potential, and then eventually there's action potentials that go from the optic nerve from the eye into the brain. The main place, 90% of these in primates, go to this place in the brain, part of the thalamus, the lateral geniculate nucleus that we'll take a look at. And then from there, they go to the back of the brain in the occipital lobe, which you'll remember is concerned with vision. The first place they go is primary visual cortex, V1. And then from there, they go to second order visual cortex, higher order visual cortex, and they keep going. And stuff happens here. We know a fair amount about what happens. So early on here, these neurons in these regions respond not to complex objects out there in the world, but to simple kinds of features that are closer to what's actually just represented in the output from the retina. Edges, changes in contrast, changes in motion, just very simple features. And then from that, they construct representations in these higher order regions to more complex objects. So for instance, here in V1, you would find, or in LGN, you would find neurons that just respond to edges or dots of light or something like that. Whereas down here, you would find neurons that respond to things like faces or some very complex stimuli. So obviously, there are faces and things out there in the world that the monkey wants to recognize. It doesn't have that to work with at the level of the retina. It just has a bunch of uh, action potentials that don't get described faces. So it needs to somehow infer faces and build and construct a representation of objects. So that's what's done here. And then eventually, if it sees that, so you're flashing something on the screen, the task of the monkey is to push a button. It has to link what it sees, the representation of a face or something on the screen, to making a decision to make an action, push the button. So these parts of the brain have to eventually hook up to motor parts of the brain. And so they project to the frontal lobe where decisions are made, then here where actions are planned, and then finally motor cortex, and these go down to the spinal cord, they're motor neurons, and they go to the muscles, and the thing pushes a button. 
Okay, so you can see how this roughly works. It's obviously much more complicated, but we will try to give you a flavor for how it works by going through these systems. So the visual system here, later on in the class, we'll talk about the motor system, and you'll see how this, this part here with the spinal cord and the muscles also works. Any questions about the broad um, scheme here, oversimplified as it is? But it makes sense to you, right? So the basic, that's basically what we want to do. We want to have a diagram that explains this and understand the computations that are being carried out in each of these regions. So one, um, you know, one, question, one thing that you might say is, well, all the information, really, that you have to work with is there at the level of the retina. So why not just hook up the retina to the muscle and you're done? Why bother having a big brain there, right? So presumably there's a need for this, and you can't just do that. Uh, or if you tried doing that, it would be le much less flexible. And indeed, if you did that, you hooked up the retina to the muscles directly, you would have something that's like a reflex, and you could have some patterns, but they would be extremely inflexible, would be very difficult to learn, and you wouldn't have anything like the flexibility that you have with this architecture in here. So the question is exactly, what, is, what do all these processing, extra processing steps in the big brain buy you? What exactly are they doing computationally? So um, Charles Sherrington, uh, who won the Nobel Prize back in the 1930s, um, wrote this um, book here, The Integrative Action of the Nervous System, and classified different sensory modalities in terms of uh, sort of their relationship between the, the body of the animal and stuff out there in the world. So there are teleroceptive ones. So there is like remote sensing. So you're sensing something that's far out there that is not uh, at the body surface or internal to you. And so vision and hearing are sensory modalities concerned with that. They're objects that are distant to you. You don't have sort of, you know, direct modes of access to them. Instead, you have to use spectral reflectance of light rays that bounce off of those objects that come into the eye. And from that, you construct, you know, the apple or the blackboard or the, or the clock on the wall or whatever is out there. Same with audition. There's something way out there, and it emits a sound, and it's pretty far away. And so the, the computational challenge here for the brain is how to construct a representation of objects that are out there, given that at the level of the sensory interface with the world, the retina or the cochlea in the ear for hearing, um, you only have certain kinds of information to work with from which you have to make often ill-posed inferences about what kind of distal stimulus would have caused that, uh, that stimulus, that kind of pattern of light on your retina, for instance. Proprioceptive is different, so that's different information that you have to work with. It's not stimuli out there in the world, but this is concerned with uh, your sense of limb position in the body. So there's lots of sensors in there uh, that we'll talk, that you'll hear about uh, when in the lectures on the motor system. Um, there's extraceptive, so this is to some extent also concerned with objects out there in the world, but they're not far from your body, but they're touching your body. So this is the sense of touch. Um, so the, you know, the, your whole body surface, basically. And you, you can explore objects with that. And of course, with many objects, um, you explore them with multiple sensory modalities. And interesting questions would be which sensory modalities give you more reliable evidence than others. So you might think, for instance, that if you hear some kind of sound, what do you do? Well, you try and look there to see what's making the sound, because vision usually gives you more reliable evidence than does hearing. And, you know, if you can't see it very well, you might walk up to it, you might want to touch it. Um, and so all these different uh, behaviors of yours would be an active exploration of the world that would bring you information from different sensory modalities as you try to obtain information about objects in the world. And then, of course, you know, we don't do this so much, but if you watch, uh, say, babies, <laughs> what they will do is if they see or hear something, well, they crawl up to it, they touch it, and then they put it in their mouth, right? So they go right sort of to the closest form of uh, interaction with the object. It's not always a good idea, but at least then you know right away if it's good to eat or not. <laughs> so chemoreceptive senses, smell and taste, um, we'll, we'll talk about as well. Um, and then finally, one that's off, that has been uh, neglected historically, but is uh, probably very important, is all the, uh, all the information that your brain gets from all your internal organs. So your brain gets information from your lungs, from your heart, from your blood vessels, from, you know, from your bladder, lots of information. Um, much of, most of that is not consciously registered by you. Uh, so in general, you wouldn't, unless you're having a heart attack or something, you wouldn't know, you know, you wouldn't really know how fast your heart is beating, you wouldn't be very aware of it. 
Um, nonetheless, your brain needs all this information for homeostatic regulation of these organs all the time. So there is, your brain is always plugged into your body, even if you're in a you know, sensory deprivation tank or something, you're getting lots of interoceptive information all the time, mostly below the, the level of conscious awareness. So here's the question then for uh, vision, and we will have analogous ones for other sensory systems. So for those of you that uh, have the PDF or have looked at the PDF of the lecture, what's the answer to this question? What is seeing? So if you had to describe, you know, to an alien that did not have uh, vision as a sensory modality, what vision is? What would you say? You can't just say, well, you know, it's like stuff that you see, you know, because they wouldn't have that. What, you know, what could you, what uh, definition could you give? Anybody want to say what it is? Have you looked at the PDF? Do you have the PDF? Or independently of the PDF, do you want to take a stab at the question? Yes, Olivia. You know if something is by the two? Good. Okay, so the, indeed, that is the answer on the PDF. Uh, to know what is, what is where by looking, close, close to that. This is um, the answer uh, that a famous vision scientist, David Marr, in his book Vision, wrote back in the 1980s, early 80s. And it's a good answer because it illustrates some of the computational um, problems that vision is trying to solve and indeed gives us insight into what different parts of the brain are doing when you see something. So this part here to know is obviously a little problematic. So typically you would infer this from the behavior of an animal. But then th this part here is uh, informative. So you have to identify what something is and there is a sort of a pathway in the brain that we'll be taking a look at that is concerned with object recognition. So it figures out what things are in the world. So if you look around you right now, you can recognize what objects are, you know, tables, faces, clocks, etc. So that's one kind of information, and it's processed mostly in a stream that goes ventrally from visual cortex into the temporal lobe, concerned with object recognition, to figure out what objects are. In addition to knowing what something is, you don't just see faces and ch chairs and clocks, but you also know where they are located in space and relative to one another. So spatial location, where things are is obviously pretty important too because it allows you to act in the world. And that turns out to be processed by a different visual stream that goes dorsally from visual cortex into the parietal lobe. So your brain needs to figure out a lot of things, but to first order, these two are the broadest um, processing streams. Object recognition concerned with figuring out what things are, and then some stream concerned with figuring out where things are in space to guide action towards them, where things are. And you do this not by taking a picture like a camera would, but by actively exploring the visual world with your eyes. So your eyes are always moving around, and so you do this by looking. So these things emphasize that vision consists of separ separable problems. You have to do, figure out what something is, where something is, and you do it actively by looking. Okay. So this just says what I said. Um, David Marr, in this book, um, thought that one good way of trying to gain insight into how the brain does this was to decompose the problem of vision into these three different so-called levels of analysis. So at the very top is a sort of computational theory. What's the broad goal? So this would be a goal that animals, even with eyes and nervous systems very different from yours, as long as they <coughs> inhabit a similar kind of environment, would all need to solve. So you know, flies have compound eyes that look completely different from me. Their nervous systems are totally different. But many of the same computational problems would be similar because they, sh they share a common world with the same laws of physics. The algorithm that nervous systems implement, this gets more detailed. And this, again, there's a lot of similarity across different species and nervous systems. But there are also a lot of idiosyncrasy. So some animals have solved these computational problems with algorithms that are different from what other animals have used. And then the actual hardware implementation, how you actually do this in eyes and brains, differs a lot across different animals. So eyes evolved independently many, many times. There are many different kinds of eyes, and there are many different nervous systems. Um, but many, many animals can use um, light to you know, find out something about the world. So that, that's one way of, of, of thinking about it. What are all the cues? available, so there are many, and we're not going to really spend any time in detail going through all of these, um, but it's, it's worth just listing them and you know, um, having a list for, for how this might work. So where something is projected onto the retina, because of the optics of the lens, gives you information about where it is located in the visual, visual field out there, how bright it is, it's 
rate of the luminance, the ratios of wavelengths in your retina that are activated by it, gives you information about the color, um, and so forth. So there's a, the particular cues that the visual system can then use of, make use of in order to infer these properties here on the visual stimulus. And the other thing to point out, um, as you might imagine, is that if you look at the retina, in general, there will be um, a lot of correlation between receptors that are spatially adjacent. So as we'll see, and the visual system will work our way through this in just a second, there's a lot of topography, but um, neurons that are similar to one another, if you don't do anything else, will be very highly correlated because objects tend to not be too discontinuous in the world. And so because of the way the of statistical regularities in the world, if there's an apple or something out there, then all the neurons that are kind of close to that and represent the apple will all be, you know, representing red, round, whatever the properties are of that apple. And um, in the retina and in other sensory systems, one thing that sensory systems do is try actively to decorrelate uh, spatially adjacent neurons in order to maximize the information that they can uh, transmit. So let's just go through the different stages of processing. So transduction happens in the retina in photoreceptors, and that's just converting light that's coming in into changes in electrical potential. From there on, that is everything that your brain has to work with. So it just has to work with whatever electrical potentials are generated in the retina. We'll take a little more look at that today, and then Henry Lester will talk to you more about it on Friday. Then there is sort of early perception. where um, So these are computational processes, typically early in time and early in the visual process, in, in the streams of visual processing neuroanatomically, that are concerned with representing what's out there, but not yet linking it to any, anything that's particularly synthetic or constructive. Uh, so just seeing, uh, you could think of it as, you know, what a baby, if its eyes were like your eyes, would be able to see, or what other animals, you know, say a frog or something, could see if you showed it a face. So presumably, you know, a cat or a frog an animal with a reasonable visual system, if you showed it a face of Obama, say, would have some representation in terms of the lines and you know, where there are changes, etc. It wouldn't necessarily recognize this as a face, and it certainly wouldn't link this to knowledge that this is the president of the US. So it would have early, it would have just visual representation that's not yet linked to any other knowledge of the world, which is something that your brain would do. So this is early on, and then what would happen is that later on, your brain would link this with other information that it has stored, and you would recognize the face as the face of a familiar person, President Obama, or your friend, or whatever it is. So, but there's stages that you have to go through. This doesn't happen in one step, and these are dissociable. We know that these are, to some extent, not to first order, um, discrete stages of processing, because you can have damage to the brain in certain patients that can dissociate these. So you can have damage to higher order parts of the brain where people fail to be able to recognize faces. They can't recognize that this is Barack Obama. In extreme cases, they can't even recognize it's their own face in a mirror. But they can see the face just fine. It's not that they don't see the face. They just don't know what it means, and they can't link it to its meaning. They can distinguish it. If you show two faces side by side, they can perfectly well tell them apart, but they can't recognize who it is. So recognizing who it is isn't, it's not sufficient to just represent the information that's there in perception. You would need to link that to other kinds of information, in particular information that's stored, broadly speaking, in memory that, that you've learned. You've learned that this face happens to be the face of the president of the US, and his name happens to be Barack Obama, and all the other knowledge that you have stored, but that's not in the, per in the early perception. So your brain would just have a visual representation of the face that, that, that then needs to be linked to lots of other information so that you recognize it as the face of Barack Obama, etc. And of course, this, you know, this happens very automatically and effortlessly in most cases, but it nonetheless depends on discrete processing stages. And we know that they're discrete to some extent because we can dissociate them. And then after that, there's many other things that come into play. So you can make judgments on the basis of what you recognize. So you might think, well, I see a face. I recognize it as Barack Obama, I remember that that's the president of the US, and I think he's not a very good president, or whatever judgment you have. And then you might plan an action on that, and eventually link this to behavior. Okay, so, basic, very broadly speaking, this would, the stages, these stages of processing would map onto something like sensation, 
knowledge about the world, forming a belief, and then acting and making a decision on the basis of that belief. So there are various tasks. There are also uh, words for tasks that map onto these discrete stages of processing. And then, as I mentioned, there are uh, disorders that you have in patients who've had a stroke or something to the brain that allow you to some extent to dissociate those processing stages. So the very simplest task would be detection. So in this task, I would simply ask you, was there something there or not? So I show you it's like a face on a screen, and all you have to say, was there something there or not? There's no recognition, there's no memory needed, it's very simple. Discrimination is a little more complicated, um, and you can do this across time, or you can do it contemporaneously, but this would be, is this face the same as this other face? So I'll show you two faces. You have to do a bit more. You can't just say there was something there. You have to represent the details of the face in order to distinguish it from other, often very similar looking faces, but you don't need to recognize any of them yet. Categorization, you still have to do more. You have to you know, say these are female faces, these are male faces, these are happy faces, these are angry faces. And then recognition would mean that you could link the face, say, to a name, to all the conceptual knowledge you have, have that, of that person, and then, of course, you know, the, the name is the final one. And so these can be, to some extent, dissociated. And you don't need disorders to dissociate them. It happens to me, and it probably happens to you all the time, that you see a person, you recognize them, and you know who they are, but you can't come up with a name. You, have, you know the name, but you can't link your recognition of them to the name. You just say, yeah, that's, um, you know, and you sort of on the tip of your tongue, but you can't come up with the name. If someone tells you that that's, it comes up with a name, then you can recognize it as the correct name. So it's not that you didn't know it, but you just couldn't link these. And there's some disorders that have that in the extreme case, where people can tell you everything about a person except their name. Uh, there are people who have amnesia, so they would have memory problems. They can recognize and perceive objects in the world, but they can't, uh, they can't re remember anything. And then various forms of so-called agnosia. We'll take a little more look at these on Monday, uh, where you dissociate perception from um, recognition. So people could discriminate faces, but they wouldn't be able to recognize them, for instance. Okay, so let's go through what uh, the, the visual, some basic properties of a visual system. Probably the most important one is topography. So topography, remember, is a mapping in the brain to the world. And in the case of the visual system, the topography is retinotopic. In some other sensory systems, the, the topography is something else, but so it's retinotopic. So there is a map of, on, of the visual world on the retina, it's just inverted, and that's just due to the optics of the eye. So it's because of, of, a, of a lens here that, you know, it's just like shown here, you have an inverted image of this cup that is there on your retina. That topography on the retina, in turn, is preserved at higher stages of processing. So you also have topography in the lateral geniculate nucleus, and you also have topography in V1, and indeed you have some topography, it starts breaking down more, as you go to higher visual regions. They're maps of the visual world in your brain as a consequence of the, the optics of the eye, basically. Any questions about that that's clear to people? Okay. And so the eye looks like this. You have the cornea, you have a lens in our eye, um, and this has a refractive index that's greater than water, and so it bends light, just like a glass lens would in your camera, only much less so and projects an image, then an inverted image of the world onto the retina. And so then what the retina needs to do is to transduce this into a pattern of electrical impulses that your brain has to work with. There are many different uh, eyes that evolved. Here's some pictures of them. Uh, and as I mentioned, these animals often have similar computational problems to solve. In some cases, the algorithms are even similar. But the hardware, hardware can be very different. So for instance, the cephalopod, the nautilus here, doesn't even have a lens. It just has a pinhole eye, very, very simple. Insects, like flies or dragonfly, I guess this is, have compound eyes. Um, you know, other animals have weirdly shaped pupils, like I guess a goat or something up here, octopus. Um, and uh, for instance, here, some animals have very, very specialized eyes. Spiders are good for this. So if you look at spy, uh, spiders that hunt, well, all spiders hunt, but like wolf spiders or jumping spiders are, are, are very good. They have different eyes that do different things. Um, and and one, one interesting thing, so for instance, with respect to spiders, their eyes are fixed in their exoskeleton, um, and so they can't move their eyes, unlike you can move your eyes to explore the world. 
So how do they explore the world? Well, they can move around their whole body around. But another way that they can do that is to move the retina rather than moving the eye. And actually, the, this is what you see here. So in these, in these spider eyes here, um, this vertical slot, this vertical line here is the retina. And if you watch these, you can actually see this in jumping spiders if you have like a binocular um, microscope. It doesn't have to be too high powered. You can move your finger around and you can see in the little spider that this slit will move from left to right and scan like a flatbed scanner. It'll sort of scan, uh, scan the world. So they have a, a, a vertical retina here that can, that can scan rather than moving the pupils. Here's one of the earliest drawings, in this case of a bird retina by Ramoni Cajal, that makes the point that the retina has a very crystalline, very specific organization. Uh, it's maybe not quite as beautiful as the cerebellum, but uh, nonetheless, it has enticed many people to work on it because of how, uh, how nice it looks under a microscope. Marcus Meister uh, here, is, who's a professor in biology, uh, for instance, works on the retina and tries to figure out, you know, given this nice architecture, how this looks, if we stick electrodes in here, what can we find out about the computations that these differently shaped neurons are, um, are doing and contributing to vision? All right, so here's some factoids about the retina. Uh, the one main one immediately to note, or two main ones, one is that the cells that transduce light into electrical potential, the photoreceptors, that you'll hear much more about on Friday, come in two big flavors, cones, which can uh, distinguish very fine things that are concerned with color vision, and rods that are much coarser but much more sensitive and to give you your night vision. There are many, many more rods, 100 million or so, then there are cones, five million or so. There are only about a million um, axons that leave the retina and go into the brain. So right away, you can see that there has to be a massive convergence, in particular of the rods, onto the output of the retina. So each axon, each optic nerve fiber that goes into the brain must get input from many, many photoreceptors. As a consequence of that convergence, these can be quite sensitive. So all you need is you know, a few rods to detect like a single photon of light, and that might be sufficient to give an action potential going into the brain. Uh, so there's a lot of convergence, and there are many more rods which are concerned with the most sensitive form of vision, like night vision, than there are cones, kind of what you would expect. Uh, so if we magnify a little bit of the retina, so here's our eye, here's the lens up here, and here's the retina down here, it would look like this. Um, and there are a couple of weird features about it. One main one is that light comes in and has to go through all the processing layers until it gets to the photoreceptors. So the photoreceptors are down here. They're down towards the inside of your retina, close to something called the pigment epithelium that's concerned with recycling these photoreceptors and nourishing them because they have a very high metabolic rate. And then on top of that are all these other parts of the retina, and up here there would be retinal ganglion cells and axons that then would go on the, run on the inside of the retina and then exit here where the optic nerve is. This is where, the blind, where your blind spot would, would be. So as a consequence of that, the light has to go through all of these different layers until it gets to the photoreceptors. Your retina is inside out compared to how you might think it would be best to engineer it if you wanted to have the best access of light to the photoreceptors. And so it's illustrated again here. This is now flipped with respect to what we just saw. So light is coming in here. Photoreceptors are up here. And then there's these layers of processing. Down here, these are retinal ganglion cells. These are the, the cells that, send, that make action potentials and send them out through axons that constitute the optic nerve that goes into the brain. That the layers of all of those axons that keep getting bigger and bigger as they get closer to the optic nerve are closest to where the light comes in. And then there's the retinal ganglion cells, then there's other cells, and for the farthest away from where the light comes in, on the inside of the retina, are the photoreceptors. So it's inside out. Um, there are, what this shows, if you um, know a little bit more, this is a bit jumping ahead, you, can, um, you would be able to tell me which, roughly, which, parts of the, which part of the retina this is an illustration of. So it's not the fovea, which is where you have the highest spatial resolution, because at the fovea you have only cones. So the fovea has no rods and just has cones. You have very good color vision there, you have very good spatial resolution. The rods 
increase in number as you go more peripherally. This is why if you want to see something that's very faint, like a very faint star at night, you can't look at it directly. It'll go away, because if you foveate it, your fovea only has cones, and those are not good for night vision. You have to look off to the side a little bit, and then you can see the star because of the rods um, that it is projecting onto. So these are the photoreceptors. They transduce light. They have graded action potentials. And the, there's then a lot of different processing layers that eventually give rise to action potential for the brain, and all of these have different names that are illustrated here. One um, question, we don't have any, much time to devote on this, although Henry will mention a bit more on Friday, is um, why you see in color. So you have three different kinds of cones that have different photopigments, and the relative combinations of those is what allows you to see uh, in color. Most mammals can't see in color. They don't have trichromatic vision as you do. Most mammals do not. And so a dog doesn't. A dog would see only this here. And so if you showed, in particular, most animals are red-green colorblind. And so if you showed a picture like this to a dog, it would be, you know, would look more like this. And so one question, it seemed it's very sort of prominent in our conscious experience of the world to see lots of colors. And one question that's not the answer to which isn't well known, it isn't known, is why we see in color, in particular, red-green um, color like this. One answer may be, like what's illustrated in this picture here, I don't actually know what these are, maybe cranberries or something? Currents, pretty currents. Uh, one answer may be that it helps us to break camouflage in order to identify something that was very important in the diet of our ancestors, which is ripe fruit. So when fruit get ripe, they turn from green to orange or red, and it would help to be able to see that. And so having the kind of trichromatic color vision that we have that allows us to dis distinguish between red and green uh, allows us to do that. Of course, some people, in particular in males, because the genes for the color pigments, the opsins that code for these, are on the X chromosome, uh, some people are color blind. So red-green color blindness is, uh, affects about 1% of the population. So if an ophthalm, ophthalmologist, ophthalmologist, when you go to the eye doctor, would look inside your eye to check that everything's fine, and they see all the blood vessels in there, and we can superimpose onto this where uh, the fovea and other parts would be. So the blood vessels all come out where the optic nerve exits the retina. So that's called the optic disc. So there all the blood vessels come out, and then they go on the inside of the retina to nourish the retina. And this would also be where your blind spot is, because this is also where all the retinal ganglion cell axons exit as the optic nerve. And they have to do that by going through the retina, since they're on the light side of the retina, on the side of the retina where the light hits. Down here, some distance away from that, you have a region it's a little darker. It's called the macula. This is a problem in older people where you have macular degeneration. If this degenerates, it's very bad because it happens to contain the region of the retina that has the highest density of photoreceptors. In particular, it has all cones that are all squished together very tightly. And so you have really good spatial resolution because the spatial packing of the cones is so tight and because there is topography because of the way that the lens projects the visual world onto the retina. So what you try to do when you read, for instance, is you move your eye so that the text that you want to identify falls on this part of the retina, the fovea. If you don't do that, it's going to look blurry. And so the spatial resolution is something like this. If you fixate, if you look at the center here, then the idea is, maybe it doesn't work for everybody here, that you should be able to read all of these letters equally well. So this exercise shows you that right around your retina, you, can, you have much higher spatial resolution because you can read these tiny letters, whereas if you're looking here at the center, then you need really big letters out in the periphery in order to be able to distinguish them equally well. And that's because the cone packing is so tight in the middle but falls off as you go out. So this um, baby monkey here just illustrates the point that you explore the world with your eyes. So this monkey, monkeys like many... Uh, animals would be very interested in other animals. The monkey is very interested in the human face, just like we are. Very salient stimulus. And so it's exploring the visual world with its eye and head movements and trying to fixate the face in order to process the information. So what your brain or what your retina has is a picture something like this. 
that you're making eye movements, rapid eye movements to cards all the time. Your resolution is greatest in the center and blurry as you go out. And this, so this is what it would kind of look like if you made a movie of how things look at the level of the retina. Now, it doesn't look like that when you look around the world, so presumably your brain has lots of mechanisms to compensate for these rapid eye movements uh, and make sense of the world in a much more stable way. But so this, so this is one, the basic aspect then of the active part of vision that we had in that little um, answer to what is, uh, what is seen. You might detect something out there in the periphery. You have great sensitivity there because you have lots and lots of rods. They're good for very faint things. They're also good for detecting motion. So if there's something faint, if there's something moving off the, to the side, you're very good at detecting that. There's something there. But you can't recognize it because you're unable to get sufficient resolution to construct a good image of what it is. So the first thing that you do is you move your eyes or your head or both so that you fixate this. So this Something out there in the periphery will grab visual attention. That directs a mechanism that moves your eyes and sometimes your head so that you foveate it. So whatever was moving there is now no longer in the periphery, but you're looking straight at it. And then you can process it with your cones and identify it and get maximal information. Of course, if you're too far away, you would move closer and, and so forth and do whatever it takes to get uh, the information that you need to be able to identify what it is. So it's illustrated here. What this plots in terms of eccentricity on the x-axis, so the fovea here is at zero, and as you get more to the side, either to the side of your head temporally or towards your nose nasally, uh, that's plotted on the x-axis, and on the y-axis is the density of different photoreceptors. So remember the rods, sensitive for night vision, they're very dense in the periphery, but they plummet, and in fact they're none at the fovea. The cones, by contrast, are essentially absent in the periphery, and they really shoot up and get really high in the fovea. And how this might look if you looked at, uh, at the retina in a schematic way, with the rods being red and the cones being these little greenish, yellow, ugly things, uh, is illustrated on the top. So in addition to just these ratios of rods to cones changing, what changes is the size of the cones. The cones are pretty big and sparse in the periphery, and they get really, really dense and smaller so that you can pack them very tightly together at the fovea. Um, let me skip this one. Okay, so this, uh, so as before, there's a couple of boxes with text here in the PDF of the lecture that uh, uh, summarize the main points that you need to know. So this is this little answer that we had here, vision is to know what's where by looking. Different species might implement this in different ways. They're going to need different eyes, but they might all have to solve the same computational problem. The retina is very complicated already. So there's lots of processing that we haven't really talked about. Um, and then there's lots of different kinds of computations that happen in the retina. One main one is that there's huge divergence, in a, especially in the case of rods. There are many, many rods, 100 million. There are only one million axons exiting the eye, so it's at least a hundred to one compression ratio. There's some divergence as well. So at the fovea, uh, you can have um, uh, cones diverging to some extent, and there's more complicated processes like decorrelation in the retina as well. Okay. What happens next? So the, from the retina, we go into the brain. The retina projects to several places in the brain. We need to know uh, just the names of these very vaguely not much detail about all of them, but uh, except for the thalamus. So most of the input, most of the output from the retina, most of the retinal ganglion cells in your retina and in monkey retina, about 90%, project to a nucleus in the thalamus, which is in the middle of the brain, called the lateral geniculate nucleus. Some of them also project to other areas. So they project to something called the optic tectum, which you may remember from the development lecture. This is the one the, the, um, the counterpart to visual cortex that uh, animals like goldfish or frogs have. This is the part of the brain that Roger Sperry studied in his chemoaffinity um, theory. So the superior colliculus is the mammalian homologue of that. So fish and amphibians, it's called the optic tectum. In us, it's called the superior colliculus, but that's the, that's the homologue that we have. So there are also projections from the retina in your eye to the superior colliculus in your brain. It's pretty small. What does this do? It's not concerned with object recognition. So this doesn't help you to recognize objects. 
it's probably, it probably contributes nothing to your conscious visual experience either, but it is concerned with making rapid eye movements and head movements. So it has something to do with very rapid, reflexive kinds of movements in order to detect stimuli, which is something that you might imagine you would want to do in a very quick and perhaps separate way, independently of conscious vision and object recognition. Uh, so that's what that part does. Your retina also projects, and again, a small percent only, to uh, nuclei in the brain that are concerned with um, uh, regulating how, what, how big your pupils are. So if, if the light is very bright, your pupils will constrict. If it's very dark, they will open up, as you would expect. And there are mechanisms in the brain, there's a circuit that regulates that, that involves um, other kinds of nuclei. There are parts of your brain uh, that those of you that have experienced jet lag know about, that you know, we have circadian rhythms, and so the light-dark cycle that you experience entrains lots of bodily rhythms. And there's a part, a nucleus in the hypothalamus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, SCN, that gets input from the retina that has to do with circadian rhythms. One feature that's important and different from um, many other sensory systems is that there is no feedback at all from the brain to the retina. So the retina projects purely feed forward into the brain. There's no feedback. And that's completely different from every visual processing stage subsequently. So at the thalamus, at the level of the thalamus, at the level of visual cortex, there is a huge amount of feedback, more feedback than feed forward, but not at the level of the retina. Retinal ganglion cells only project to the thalamus. They get no feedback from the thalamus. So the visual system you remember from the first discussion section where we, dissect, where we looked at a human brain, uh, we were able to identify a few things. The brains weren't in as good a shape as this brain. But you remember we saw the um, olfactory nerves, cranial nerve one, that were stuck in the front. Those are those things up here. And we were able to identify, as here, the stumps of the optic nerve. So those are those white things. We're looking at the bottom of a brain here. Here's the front at the top. Here's the back the bottom. So we've turned the brain upside down. The spinal cord would be coming out at you if it were attached to this brain. And these would carry the, the uh, million axons from each eye. So the eyes would be you know, somewhere up here, and then the optic nerves would be running in. So the stumps of the optic nerves are here. Parts of them cross at this point, called the optic chiasm, such that the optic tracts, which are now the continuation of the optic nerve, after some of the fibers have crossed, are arranged such that the left optic tract has all the information from the right half of the visual world, and the right optic tract has all the information from the left half of the visual world. That's not the case at the optic nerve. The left optic nerve has information from the left eye that has both left and right visual fields represented. And the right optic nerve has information only from the right eye that has both right and left visual fields represented. So the, they cross in such a way the optic chiasm that rather than corresponding to eye, the optic nerves now map to visual field, left and right visual field. Okay. Then they go into the thalamus here and all these other places that I mentioned that you don't need to know about in detail. From the thalamus, there are then projections which they've dissected part of the brain for you to be able to see to occipital cortex back here, primary visual cortex. These projections, one thing to appreciate is that these projections here from the thalamus back to V1 are much bigger. There are many, many more axons here than came in from the eyes in the first place. And that's typical. So you have lots and lots of connections and lots of processing in the brain that looks much denser than the information you get from the world because, in a sense, your brain is sort of creating information by the computations that it does. If you flatten the monkey brain and sort of map out the different parts of, visual, of the visual system, that's shown here in this um, famous picture from a guy called David Van Essen, who was once here at Caltech teaching this course, actually. So here would have the retina. They would go in through the optic nerves. They would mix in a certain way. They go to the thalamus, lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus, primary visual cortex, and then there would be many other visual cortices, with different parts of visual cortex, that are all concerned with processing different aspects of a visual stimulus. Some are more concerned with processing color, some are more concerned with processing motion, and so forth. So let's take a quick look at where these are in the brain again. Here are your four lobes. 
we've seen before, the cerebellum and the brainstem. And you remember, if we take a look at uh, the medial, uh, uh, medial part of a hemisphere here, so this is the right cerebral hemisphere we're looking at, its medial aspect. Here's the frontal lobe, here's the parietal lobe, like here's the occipital lobe, and in this, on the upper and lower banks of this sulcus here, which is called the calcarine sulcus, lies primary visual cortex, which is also known as Brodmann's area 17. So these things you need to, these you need to know. You need to know the name of this, the calcarine sulcus. You need to know that this corresponds to primary visual cortex, and that corresponds to a cytoarchitectonic region called Brodmann's area 17. So this is the first cortical area that gets visual input, and it has a map of the visual world. And then next to that, you have higher order visual regions, uh, V2, V3, V4, and, and so forth. So one uh, theme you remember is that neocortex is organized into maps. These are topographic, retinotopic, in our case, uh, and that the higher order cortices are adjacent to the primary ones. Uh, we just saw that here. Okay. Uh, remember that uh, in the case of vision, as I've just told you, all information has to go through the thalamus before it gets to cortex. And that's the case for all sensory modalities except for smell. The thalamus looks like this. If we have the brain here, here's the corpus callosum, here's the thalamus. It's a collection of a whole bunch of nuclei, schematized down here. And in your brains, it looks sort of like these nuclei here. The ones that you need to know about is the lateral geniculate nucleus, that's concerned with vision. The medial geniculate nucleus we'll cover in a later lecture. That's concerned with hearing, with audition. And then these ones here are concerned with uh, touch, VPM and VPL, the ventral posterior medial and ventral posterior lateral nuclei. So the specific nuclei of the thalamus that relay information from sensory modalities to the primary sensory cortices, visual cortex, auditory cortex, somatosensory cortex. The LGN, lateral geniculate nucleus, looks like this. There are layers to it, six layers in total. It's topographic, retinotopic. So if you marched your electrode, like I'm doing with this pointer, across this, the tissue of the lateral geniculate nucleus, you would find neurons that respond to stimuli located in particular parts of visual space. So there's a map of the visual world. And then in addition, this structure begins to create other maps. So it has it maps, for instance, input from, the, from which eye it's coming, contralateral eye up here, ipsilateral, contralateral, ipsilateral, and so forth. And it starts to map input from different retinal ganglion cells. Down here, ones that are concerned with more fast uh, kinds of processing, ones up here that are concerned more with color and detail. And so it begins, it begins in the retina, and it's more clear in the lateral geniculate nucleus, and we will see it on Monday in, uh, in the visual cortices that there are different processing streams. And as I mentioned, two really broad ones are concerned with our answers to that initial question. So there are different parts of this lateral geniculate nucleus and different processing streams from the projections of this region into cortex that have to do with figuring out what an object is, object identification, and where it is located in space, for instance, so different, uh, different functions. Okay, to just finish off, and um, you should just look at these pictures in the PDF and also in your book. It's fairly straightforward, so I'm not going to, you know, there's no point going in detail here, but just look at the pictures. Um, the, you know, this will map out for you in detail where, if you have a stimulus in the world, that stimulus falls on the retina, and how that then projects to the LGN and higher up. The most informative picture, uh, sorry, it has little animations in there. The most informative picture is, is this one here, somewhat overwhelming, but you can work your way through this. So if you show someone an image like this, if you're staring at the center here, then all these differently colored quadrants that are up or down or left or right or central or peripheral, coded by color, will fall onto different parts of the retina. So if you're staring at this in the middle, the yellow and the green parts will fall near your fovea. So that's right in here, yellow and green. And then the red and the blue will fall more outside the fovea, and they will fall in different parts of the retina. 
because of the optics of the eye and the retinotopic mapping we have. And then the retinal ganglion cells from there project to different parts of the thalamus and different parts of visual cortex. So work your way through this and look at the book um, so that you know how topography in the brain is organized. Perhaps just to go back to this one picture, uh, one, uh, to first order, a lot of things are flipped. So the image on your retina is flipped already to begin with, but this is also the case in visual cortex. So the upper banks of V1, the upper banks of the calcarin sulcus, map the lower visual field. The lower bank of the sulcus maps your upper visual field. So the visual world is flipped there. And we'll take a more detailed look uh, on Monday on how this looks and also go into electrophysiology. So the last couple of slides here we'll skip for now be uh, because we're out of time and uh, we will start with those on Monday.